In 77, I applied for the astronaut program among 10,000 other people. And in 78, I got selected. There were three African Americans in that class, uh, myself, uh, Ron McNair, and Fred Gregory. I think any of the three of us could have done that role. Fred was a test pilot, Ron was an engineer, and I sort of mixed both, had, had the blend of both. But it wasn't for me um, a desire to be the first African American in space. My desire was to uh, make a contribution. STS-8. There were four rookies on the team and Dick Truly. We trained together as a team for about 15 months before we flew. It probably took me a little while to recognize the historical significance of it. Uh, and, then, and then once I sort of accepted that, then I also recognized uh, the importance of doing the job as best as I can. And it is an opportunity to open up doors for others. It was the first night launch, so we had to shift our circadian rhythm uh, and get used to sleeping in the day and living at night. Getting up at 10 o'clock at night, going to bed at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It took us a week to do that. We did that uh, primarily in uh, quarantine. The day that we were going to fly, they got us up at 10 o'clock at night. Um, and uh, we had breakfast. We suited up. About midnight, we went downstairs and climbed into the van to go out to the bird. It was raining that night, and I knew that it was going to be an exciting night because there were, I mean, people came from all over to watch this launch because I was flying. I imagined them all standing out there at 1 o'clock in the morning with their umbrellas, all asking the same question, and that is, why am I standing here, you know? The launch was slipped, I guess, about a half hour, because we were supposed to launch off at about 2. But the weather was starting to clear. Maybe a little after 2 in the morning, they felt they gave us the go for liftoff, and we counted down, and the clock marched all the way down to zero, and the solid rocket boosters lit off. We had darkened our cockpit so that we could maintain our night vision just in case we would have to do an emergency landing. Well, the first real surprise was when the solid rocket boosters lit off and lit up the cockpit. I mean, whatever night vision we were supposed to have, we lost it. The thing that surprised me was it was just like the simulators, except the vehicle actually moved. The crew taped the intercom conversation. There's somebody giggling and laughing all the way up, you know, and, and we listened to it for quite a while to try to find, figure out who that was, only to con come to the conclusion that that was me. I mean, I laughed and giggled all the way up. You know, it was such a fun ride. As we were crossing the Atlantic, you could see the sunrise and um, Africa come up over the horizon. Just spectacular, you know, and you're going into orbit upside down. Just spectacular view. But we finally got on orbit and uh, we unstrapped from the seat. I still remember unstrapping from the seat for the first time and I was floating on, t on, the, on the ceiling. I mean, I just sort of, goodness gracious, you know. And you're in harnesses, and you got to get out. And, and for the first couple of hours, you know, for rookies, it's just all arms and legs trying to get your act together. Once you get the vehicle um, uh, configured for orbit operations, you eat lunch. I mean, that's normal. You eat lunch. During that time period, that's when you find out if you're going to be comfortable or not comfortable in space. You know, you don't know uh, if you're going to suffer from this uh, space adaptation syndrome thing or not. Um, and uh, there were two members of our flight that suffered from it. Not only did I eat my lunch, but I helped eat somebody else's lunch. And our primary mission was to deploy a satellite, and I was the lead guy for that. Probably towards the end of that day, we, um, we deployed the satellite. And then the next three or four days, I had so much time that I went downstairs one, one, during one day and took a cat nap. 
Dick Truly and Dan Brandenstein were challenged with reference to flying the vehicle at night, both launch and landing at night. They figured that out. They had to serve as, uh, as trailblazers for that. I tried not to be a distraction to them, though they realized they were flying me and there would be more attention paid to me than these guys. But these guys also made major contributions on the flight. It was a great team effort. Bill Thornton did an awful lot of work looking at man's adaptation to zero-g. Dale Gardner operated the arm, the RMS. Uh, we did a couple of days engineering work uh, using the arm. The president is on the line. Yes, sir, Mr. President. We um, tagged up and spoke with Ronald Reagan on orbit which was nice. It was a nice experience and uh, they lined us up and we, we had our conversation with uh, the president at the time. Guy, congratulations. You, I think, are paving the way for many others and you're making it plain that we are in an era of brotherhood here in our land. On the sixth day, we we uh, tidied up the vehicle and turned it around and brought it home. I still remember coming home, sitting next to uh, Dale Gardner, and he had a camera taking pictures out the window, and occasionally he would hand me the camera, and the camera got heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier as we were coming home. So you could feel the, the, the gravity starting to grip grab you as you were coming in from the people at Edwards, you couldn't see the vehicle come in. They looked at the vehicle through an infrared camera as we turned finally, and people really didn't see us until we came in over the lights to land. And I still remember climbing into bed that night, and um, sleeping in the bed was like sleeping on a concrete floor. So I realized it was going to take me a couple of days to get readapted back to uh, 1G. But it was a fabulous experience. Great crew. Great experience all the way around. I think everybody is comfortable with the fact that uh, African Americans can do the job just as well as anybody else. I feel very proud to be a role model and um, I hope that uh, when people look back at me they can say, yeah, I'd like to be like Guy Bluford. That's fine with me.